Hello, um, everyone. Uh, so this is, uh, I just saw the Yakto, they just did a um, Birds of a Feller. Um, I think it worked out pretty well for them. So hopefully we'll have success as well with the virtual boff. Um, so uh, me and Stefano wanted to have a place where people talk about Risk Five here um, at the Meta Linux conference. Um, so just wanted to stop, start off with mentioning the other Risk Five um, related content that's happening here at ELC. So. Tomorrow, I'm going to give a talk about Linux on open source hardware, which we we're going to touch on here. Um, then uh, Kurt Stasanovich, who is the professor at UC Berkeley that was uh, behind creating this project, um, he's going to give a keynote on Wednesday. So you'll get a good overview of them. And Kem is going to talk about the state of software development tools on Wednesday. And then um, Callista Redman, who's the head of RISC-V International, um, which is the nonprofit that um, governs RISC-V, is going to have an expert session on Thursday. We also have lots of meetups going on, which right now are virtual. But um, Munich and Bay Area were both last week, I believe. So you can go to RISC-V.org local and check out um, what meetups are going on there. So RISC-V is a new instruction set architecture um, that was created about 10 years ago um, by a team at UC Berkeley. They were doing um, computer architecture research, and they wanted um, an instruction set that they could use to do that. They didn't want to deal with um, licensing commercial ISAs. Um, it's RISC-V um, because it's the fifth RISC instruction set to come out of Berkeley. Um, two great talks. Um, one is um, instruction sets want to be free. And this is from David Patterson, who was the co-creator of the original RISC back in the early 80s. Um, and then you'll see this on Wednesday, um, the, the kind of state of the union RISC V. Um, Kirst uh, uh, Asanovich gives this a um, couple of times a year. So you can always check out the latest one on YouTube. Kind of gives a over, full overview of what uh, RISC V is and in, in the ecosystem. Um, real quick, uh, just kind of to go over it for people that aren't familiar with ISA. Um, this is uh, a talk from uh, Anu Patel um, at the Linux um, LCA back in 2020, which was probably one of the last conferences that happened. Um, so the idea behind RISC-V is that it's a new ISA, um, clean slate and extensible. Um, so everything that was learned over the years from doing um, uh, computer architecture research at Berkeley, they put that into making this ISA. And the idea here is it goes from 32-bit small microcontrollers all the way up to supercomputers here. So it's one instruction set that can span all those different use cases. Um, and also the idea here of different privilege levels. So we have machine mode or M, which is uh, where the firmware runs, um, like bootloader, um, and then operating system runs in supervisor mode. And then above that, there's user space. Um, there's also an extension for um, hypervisor that's being worked on right now. So I mentioned it's, it's extensible. And the, one of the ways that works is it's not just one ISA, it's a set of ISAs. Um, and the key thing here is the, the base one is a 32-bit integer ISA, um, and that's frozen. That'll never change. Um, so if you were to compile for that right now, it would still work in you know 20 years on some fancy 128-bit RISC-V computer. So the idea here is there's extensions that then get ratified and frozen. Um, and you'll kind of see like these, it's kind of a soup of letters and numbers. Um, so each of these different extensions has a different letter. Um, for purposes of Linux, we generally are talking about RV64GC, uh, which means they can do integer, multiply, um, atomics, uh, and float. Um, I think that's it. But so you'll find out more of that if you check out um, the keynote on uh, Wednesday. And this was from uh, Tisha's uh, slide from LCA um, 2020. Um, and to kind of give you an overview here of, of what is the ecosystem for um, software on RISC-V. Um, so we have support now um, in a lot of things. Um, and we're going to go through that real quick here. Um, has anyone uh, raised their hand or said anything yet, Stefan? Nope. So far, no okay. questions. Going good. All right. So this is another slide from Atisha's presentation. Um, hopefully, a few of the few of the people will be able to jump in here and, and uh, speak up. Um, so the ide basic idea here is we have our normal SOC ROM, and then that goes into M mode, um, which uh, could be U boot, uh, and then we have um, Open SBI, which is this supervisory interface, and then go into U boot, and then finally boot up into Linux. So kind of a normal boot flow. Um, but one of the terms you might not be familiar with, especially if you're coming from ARM, 
is SBI. So SBI is the supervisor binary interface. Um, so there's this privilege spec. So one of the extensions for RISC-V is a privilege spec, and that defines basically you're going to have an operating system like we're familiar with, like Linux. Um, and SBI is the um, kind of way you go between the machine mode and the, the supervisor mode, S mode. Um, so it kind of sits there between the, the OS and, and um, the, the hardware. Um, and this came out of the Unix platform specification working group. Um, so you can, as an individual, join the RISC-V International Organization, and then you can um, join these um, email lists and, that talk about the Unix platform specification. So this has kind of come out of work that they're doing. Um, and in particular, so SBI is a specification, and then there's Open SBI, which is an implementation. Um, which is you'll see is very common in, in most of the different platforms that we're going to talk about. Um, and one of the things that just happened was UEFI support. There's a patch series now um, on the Linux RISC V mailing list. Um, so it's coming along um, to have that kind of generic UEFI support um, in U-Boot and in OpenSBI and then in the Linux kernel as well. Uh, so Linux distributions, and I hope he's going to be on here. Um, David um, works on the Fedora port um, and has a lot of knowledge. So if he is on here, hopefully he can give us some insights. But um, basically, both Fedora and Debian have ports. Um, SUSE is working on it as well now. Um, and then Yakto and Op Open Embedded support it. And I think um, Kem will probably talk some more about that on uh, Wednesday in his talk. Um, and there's also support in build root as well. So um, we're a little short on the hardware side right now, but the software support is really coming together. Uh, and because um, RISC-V is a relatively new thing, we don't have a lot of hardware out there that we can run, um, especially operating systems on. So QEMU is a great way um, that development's been done um, with the Linux kernel support and um, getting the distros running. Um, so if you don't have any hardware, you can, on your PC, um, uh, try this stuff out with QEMU. So I think it was maybe three ELCs ago, 2017 maybe, that um, uh, Sci-Fi was one of the sponsors. Um, we were in Portland, and they had a bunch of these boards there. Um, so this is a really exciting board. Um, it has four 64-bit RISC-V cores. Um, this board was pretty expensive, though. It was $1,000. Um, it was available in limited quantities because um, Sci-5 is not a company that's making chips. They design um, cores that then other companies might use. Um, so this is probably the best board that's out there, though it's pretty hard to get inexpensive. Um, but when you have this with the whole setup here with some additional um, FPGA expansion cards, you can actually have a full uh, Linux desktop running here. Um, and if David's able to join, he can maybe talk more about it. Um, he has one of these setups where he's working on the Fedora port. Though, uh, so the, the, the lower end version is uh, this board here, um, which has a processor called the Kendrite K210. Um, and this is something that's kind of been, been in the works for a while. Um, back in last year at Linux Plumbers, um, Demi Lamal from Western Digital, talked about experiments they were doing to get Linux running on this. So this is a dual core 64-bit RISC-V um, processor at 400 megahertz, which is actually pretty nice. The downside here is it only has eight megabytes of memory, um, which is pretty limiting. Um, it also, while it does have an MMU, they, did, they implemented a spec which was too old for it to be supported in Linux. Um, so work was done to essentially allow it to be supported with no MU and with M mode, which is machine mode instead of supervisor mode on RISC V. Um, and with Linux 5.8 kernel, um, the full support's going to be there. Um, so pretty much only you can do only thing you can do right now with it is you can um, Damien has build root with BusyBox that you can uh, run on it. Um, but in order to do anything more, we need something called FD pick support or an analog in RISC V. This is what ARM does on those. Um, no MMU um, systems where you can run Linux um, basically allows you to use um, shared libraries. So without like shared libraries, we run out of space very quickly. Um, so that work is still ongoing, um, though I asked on the list recently. It doesn't look like there's anything new right now. Um, 
So the other cool thing is U-Boot, um, there's a patch series that adds um, support for that that was just posted for, for one of those Cypede boards um, with the Kendrite K210 chip. Uh, now, one of the things I'm quite excited about, though it's not quite here yet, um, so there's an organization called the Open Hardware Group um, that's working with different companies like uh, NXP, uh, and I think there's a couple other silicon labs maybe. Um, so the, the really interesting thing here is they basically took one of the IMX processors, like an IMX6 or something like that, and they took out the ARM core and they're dropping in a 64-bit uh, RISC-V core. Um, but we have the rest of the sort of peripherals that everyone's used to in, in likes on the IMX series, um, including the uh, uh, Vivante GPU. So it should be supported with the open source driver. Um, so this is really exciting. However, it's not going to tape out until the end of this year, and it's just a it's just a test um, project. So um, maybe in 2021 we'll see a product come out um, from NXP or someone else that you could actually buy and build the board around. Now I have one glaring uh, thing missing here, which since it's live, I'll just go to there. So uh, microchip has a uh, similar to like a Xilinx Zinc, they have an FPGA with a hard RISC-V core called the Polar Fire SOC. And that should have been in there. So this just launched, or this just showed up yet last week on CrowdSupply, which is a site that you can um, essentially crowdfund new boards on. Um, so this is pretty exciting. This is a, um, I think, quad-core um, RISC-V processor. Um, but this board's going to be... Um, probably at least half the, half the price of the Sci-5 board. Um, and this chip here, the Polar Fire SOC, you'll be able to buy in distribution. So we'll probably see um, later this year or next year a series of different boards that are using this SOC. Um, so there is an FPGA, but the key thing to focus on here is it has four hard um, E6 silicon RISC-V cores. Um, so so I, we did have one question yeah. <clears throat> just about... Uh, how we're coming along in terms of consumer uptake. Uh, so the Polar Fire is a good example of, you know, some of the folks that are cer currently starting to spin chips with RISC-V, um, but really just head over to our member site and look at the folks that are joining uh, specifically at the, um, at the premier level. Uh, the premier level members are really the ones you're going to look to in terms of when I see a new board coming out, who is it going to be coming from? Uh, so that's a good uh, indicator. But also in general, I think we're seeing a lot more and we hope to see a few sub $500 boards in the next year. Yeah. Um, and just a quick reminder for everyone, if you go to risk5.org, you can find all that information. Um, uh, let me flip back to the slides here. Um, so one of the other options that we have, because it, it's been taking a while for companies to make um, uh, hard SOCs, um, uh, chips that we can we can use in, in boards. Um, so one of the other options is to use FPGAs. Um, so Megan Wax from Sci5 gave an interesting talk about this um, last year, last November. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in my talk tomorrow, but um, one of the neat things that's happened with FPGAs um, recently is there's now open source tool chains for them, which is which is great because their proprietary tools were massive, um, and and this is a really nice thing that's happening in the FPGA world. And the cool thing we can do is we now have a open source tool chain that can run on a part called the Lattice ECP5 which is capable, capable enough for us to be able to run Linux on it. So we can have Linux running on a soft core inside the FPGA using only free software tools. Um, one of the boards that you could get if you wanted to play around with this is called the ULX uh, 3S. Um, that's out of a hackerspace in Croatia on Crowd Supply. Uh, and then another really nice board that I'm quite excited about is this little tiny board called the Orange Crab. And this has um, the ECP5 that you can put a soft core in um, and has 128 megabytes of DDR RAM. So it's enough for us to do some interesting things with Linux on the board. One thing another, to note, yeah. Another mm -hmm. quick question just about uh, regarding RISC-V and things like the BeagleBoard project. So I think what you're getting at is a much cheaper than $500 board. Um, I can't speak to what Texas Instruments may or may not be doing, but I can say that we're hoping to see some sub $100 boards that are capable of running Linux come out next year. 
Yes. Yeah. So um, my, one, of, one of my hopes is to uh, um, get get a hundred dollar board out there, sub one hundred dollar board. Um, and for one road and route to do that is both of these boards here with these FPGAs. Um, they're about a hundred dollars. Um, though the one downside to that is with the soft core, it's only going to run maybe 50 megahertz, 100 megahertz on a really nice FPGA. Um, so above that, you're really limited with the soft cores. Uh, what we really need is SOCs. Um, so uh, the Polar Fire um, SOC for microchips can be exciting because an F because it has an FPGA in it. I think it's going to um, probably not be cheap enough necessarily to get um, you know sort of a Beagle Bone or Raspberry Pi price. Um, I'm also hopeful that a company like Kendrite might come out with a more capable SOC with external memory because um, that Kendrite chip would be really nice if it has external memory interface. So um, I think 2021, we, we'll probably see some nice options out there. Um, and then the Open Harbor Group's test chip, um, it, you know, if that goes according to plan, I think we could see an NXP product um, that would be available in distribution. But if you don't have any hardware at all and you don't want to run, want to run QEMU, another thing you can try out is Renode. This is from Ant Micro. It's open source, essentially emulator. Um, it allows you to choose from a list of different boards and essentially run them emulated on your computer. Um, so this is me running Renode to emulate the Sci-5 Unleashed board. So that board that was $1,000, um, uh, you can emulate it on your computer. And because your computer is, you know, if, as long as your computer is uh, relatively powerful, um, it actually feels interactive. You know, it's not like chugging along at really slow speed. So it's a nice way to do things if you don't have hardware. Uh, one of the last things I want to talk about here, um, unless anyone else has uh, um, spoken up yet, um, is kind of uh, what's going on with the Linux kernel with the RISC-V support. Um, so the best resource, I would say, is it, uh, if you hop on the the Linux kernel mailing list for the RISC-V architecture. Um, you can go through the archives there on lore. Um, but some of the things that have been added recently are eBPF, um, which is exciting because everyone loves um, eBPF. Um, also KGDB, um, KExec and KDump, which help with debugging. Um, VDSO support, which helps with um, optimizing, being able to check the time. Uh, system time, um, syscaller, which is um, basically a security fuzzer. And then one of the other things was being able to build with Clang instead of GCC. Uh, and then there's other things that are upcoming, like the UEFI support. Um, there's been some work on the interrupt controllers. Um, uh, this one is a core level interrupt uh, interrupter support um, that's on the Sci-5 board. Um, there's also a hypervisor spec that's in the works for RISC-V. Um, and there is work being done to have it integrated with, QM, uh, with KVM. Uh, there's also support being worked on to um, basically uh, improve the performance measurement, PMU, and in perf, so we can start getting that performance data that we're used to on other architectures. Um, and then also um, CPU um, frequency um, driver support in the um, Sci-5 board. Um, and a great thing to check out um, was last week at the uh, Munich RISC-V meetup, um, Bjorn uh, Topol uh, gave a really great talk about what's missing in the RISC-V Linux kernel. Um, and he goes through here, um, let me just show you real quick here. Um, he goes through here and lists a bunch of things um, that are marked as to do um, and things that you could work on if you were interested um, in, in, in jumping in and helping out with stuff. And as he says, that'll keep you busy during the summer. Um, so highly recommend um, checking out um, the slides from this talk and the video should be posted this week. Um, so in the next day or two. Um, and I think that is the end of the slides. Um, have we had anyone else jump on here? Um, uh, just a quick question about yeah. uh, uh, the Google Doc. Yeah, so uh, we'll share the slides after the presentation. Yeah, uh, actually, I uh, can paste that into the. Um, oh I can yeah. Paste it in. That, that'll Perfect. work better. Here we go. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, here's five GPOs. Oh, oh yeah. So Alistair there in the chat, he is a person from Western Digital that, that, that does the QMU RISC-V support. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what uh, that means by 
uh, GPIOs, maybe emulating them. Um, so there is a GPIO mockup driver that I think would be able to work. I'm not sure. Though there should be a way for people to jump in here and talk if they want to. Um, you know, I don't know who else is joined. Oh, Atisha's in here. Yeah. So Atisha's in here. He's one of the main uh, uh, Linux kernel developers. At West, he's at Western Digital. Um, Alistair is the person working on QEMU. So are we able uh, we, to let people we talk? did have a quick, we had a question about, uh, is there a RISC-V equivalent to ARM's trust zone? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, there's actually a working group currently called the Trusted Execution uh, Group, uh, TEE group. And uh, they're working on, I believe, I'm trying to remember the version of the spec they're on. Um, Give me one sec. So the, the short answer to that is yes, there is a group that's currently working on that. Um, I know that um, I've been trying to get a uh, FPGA-based demo of trusted execution environment um, uh, capable core uh, running with the group uh, for the IETF that does hackathons on a protocol called TEEP. So, uh, and I will put those links in here. And I think my uh, I did a git push real quick to try and get this up there. Which uh, if it did, I'll I'll drop this link in the in the chat as well. Oh, I guess I did something. Else. Oh, anyways. So, does anyone want to ask a question with voice? I think we can do that. Yeah, if anyone wants to make a comment or a question, I believe you can raise your hand and we can give you uh, audio capabilities or just post the question up and we'll uh, ask it here. Maybe. Uh, oh, there we go. See. Yeah, um, well, um, Kareem mentioned there uh, about the open source implementation. So yeah, one of the things I guess maybe I should have clarified is, so RISC-V itself is just an open source instruction set architecture ISA, um, and the implementations of that can be both proprietary and open source. Um, so just because you see RISC V doesn't mean that it's an open source design, but there are a lot. Um, so uh, some of the original ones for out of Berkeley are Rocket and Boom um, with two O's. Um, so those those are being used for the basis of commercial designs. Um, I think the Sci Five stuff is based on Rocket or Boom. I think. Um, and the open harbor group stuff, the open HW group stuff, the core V, um, that one I showed you that looked kind of like an NXP IMX. That one is based on a uh, core out of ETH Zurich um, called Pulp. It's from the Pulp team there, and that one's called Ariane. Um, so a lot of the um, SSCs that we're seeing be commercialized, both in the microcontrollers and in the um, like the application processors, are based on some of these open source implementations. Um, I know for for people that are into hardware design, um, the Berkeley ones I think are based on what's that Scala language uh, Chisel, um, which I may some people may or may not like. Um, all of the ETH Zurich stuff is System Verilog, um, and that's what Open Harbor Group is doing System Verilog because they believe it'll be easier to get. Um, the SOCs built on and verified that way. Oh, what do we have here? Some other questions. Drew, do you happen to, when you click on raise hand, can you no. um, give Alejandro access to the mic? Uh, let me see here. Hello. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Hi, hello. Uh, hello. Well, thank you, uh, Drew and, and Stefano for the session. Um, so I have a question. Well, I, I was aware of, of the changes in the Linux kernel for supporting RIGS 5, but uh, it's a surprise for me to know about this no MMU uh, support for RIGS 5 in Linux kernel. So I don't know if I got it right, and um, 
this is maybe a desire or it's something that is happening. And yeah. if that is the case, um, uh, I think this is related to the clinification um, um, project that uh, was active some years ago, and I think is not active anymore, or at least I, I'm not, uh, I don't have any, any news about it. So, um, well, if you can comment about it, thank you. Yeah, so the, the support's actually there now um, in 5.8. Um, so when 5.8's released, um, the first part of the Kendry K210 support was in 5.7. Um, so now after 5.8, it'll be fully supported. Um, maybe if, if one of the other, someone from Western Digital wants to jump in, but I believe the issue with the Kendry K210 part is they do have an MMU, but they implemented a spec that was a little bit older than what Linux support. So we basically have to treat it as not having an MMU. Um, so there's no MMU, and then there's also machine mode versus S mode. Um, so given that the Kendry part doesn't have much memory, it's just running Linux kernel in machine mode, which means that we just have one address space. We don't have virtual memory or any of that sort of stuff. Um, and then the downside there is essentially you can only really one, run like one busy box session and then you don't really have much RAM to do anything else, um, which is why the uh, idea of no MU support coming up for user space. So the idea is that um, with ARM, there's a way called the FB pick of being able to have um, uh, on a, a user space without any MMU in the system, they can share memory better. Um, so that's something that that may happen there to make it more useful. Um, but for right now, for you know, it's thirteen dollars, and you can actually have a real uh, RISC five system that's running Linux at four hundred megahertz. Um, so it's an interesting thing to play around with until we get better SOCs. So we're actually running out of time here, but we did have a quick question about Renode. Um, I'm not sure, Drew, if you happen to know anything about Renode emulators and uh, if they include things like the host machines, Nick. I haven't played around with Renode enough. Yeah, it, it's quite sophisticated. Um, you can you should be able to do most things um, with it. Um, the Ant Micro people put a lot of work into it. And also the idea of being able to do uh, uh, co-development where you're both, um, some of the parts are actually in hardware and some of the parts are being emulated in software. Um, so it's it's quite, uh, there's quite a lot going on there. Uh, so Android, hello, John um, and Kareem. Um, so I don't believe uh, Android is anywhere near being supported. The main reason is uh, I don't think the Java supports uh, very good right now. Um, so I could be corrected and, and Ken might have more answers to that, but. I've not heard of anyone working on Android yet. Um, and about the open implementations, of course, um, Swerve from Western Digital is, is one of the big ones for the microcontroller class. Um, and that's all open. That's part of the, um, uh, what's the other nonprofit, the other than the Har Open Harbor Group? Um, they steward uh, the Swerve. Anyways, uh, the Logibone. Yeah, I, I think that Java is going to be a big issue to that needs to get running well before we can have Android. Um, the Logibone was a cape for the Beagle Bone. Um, someone just made kind of a new version of that with the ECP5, which is kind of interesting. Oh, um, you were thinking about Chips Alliance. Chips Alliance, yes. So Chips Alliance, if you check out Chips Alliance, they have Swerve and several other cores. Um, so like... The three main things you should look at is RISC-V International, um, Open Harbor Group, and Chips Alliance. Um, a lot of the projects are falling under those umbrellas. Right, I think we have to wrap it up. Um, getting a message that we're near the end of our time. We're already gone over. Uh, I'll put the mailing lists for Google Groups in the chat uh, for folks. Uh, those are open mailing lists to everybody, so feel free to post on there. If you have additional questions, are always well, welcome to reach out to me directly as well. So thanks, everybody, and uh, thank you very much, Drew, for all your uh, your work yeah. here with the slides. Thanks.